Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah, and uh, we thank you for what's going on in this world today. This world seems to be being turned upside down all around the Middle East as well as here in the United States. Father, we, we know we're living in times of the Messiah. And Father, I just pray that uh, as a congregation and as a nation, uh, everyone would wake up and smell the roses, so to speak, and, and realize the importance of the time that we live in. You're trying to prepare a bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And so, Father, I pray that we would get our priorities straight and that we would also just fall in love with you and we would be people who are abundant in good works and helping one another. And we just thank you for this time in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, a uh, quick review. What I'll be covering tonight is uh, the second half or part two of the Torah community that I talked about a few weeks ago. We'll have kind of a quick review uh, from the last time. There are four reasons why you want to participate in a community of believers. I mean, it's good to be part of a community. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking of, do you remember how in Genesis 1, God kept saying everything was good? Do you remember the first not good? That man should be alone. So people might say, well, it's me and Jesus. I don't need anybody else. Well, that's not true. Even God back then, even though it was God and Adam, he said, it's not good. That is just God and Adam. Okay. So uh, we really need community. The other thing to realize, the first thing I have on the notes here, is that the biblical revelation of Mount Sinai was given to a community. It wasn't given to just an individual. Uh, number two, another good reason to participate in a community is because all of the feasts, the cycle of divine appointments, were given to a community, okay? Uh, also, when you look at the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament, most of the letters were written to who? A community. They weren't written just, I mean, there was a couple that were written to just an individual, but the, the vast majority were written to a community. Also, there's a special presence of God in the community. Even the Lord himself said, where two or three are gathered together. There I am in the midst of you. So that's why it's good to be part of a community. We also learned some of the various names that are given to the believing community. Uh, one of them is called the called out community. There's the redeemed community, the holy community, the covenant community, and the Torah community. Those are some of the things we covered. Uh, we looked at some of the main characteristics of the believing community. The believing community is going to study the Bible. They're going to teach the Bible. And most importantly, what are they going to do? Live the Bible. Does it do any good to study it if you don't live it? And what happens to people who teach it and don't live it? Okay, it's the same thing. We have to learn to, uh, and again, a couple of books I want to recommend again that we have. One of them is that we have more of those Hebrew roots books if you want to know more about the roots of the Hebrew language. <clears throat> and I think we have another case of how to study the Torah that book is in. And some of these books seem to be a little expensive, but just so you know, we don't mark things up. We, matter of fact, we mark them down. If you were to buy any of these books online yourself as an individual, you're going to pay a lot more. We buy them in bulk so that we can get them at a discount, and then uh, we might round it up five cents to the even dollar or whatever it is, uh, because our main goal is to get these books out. But that one book, How to Study the Torah, is very good, and it's those principles that are in it that I use when I try to pull things together for you guys on Saturday morning. The other characteristic of the believing community is there to be righteous, okay? But now what we're going to look at tonight is... Concerning the believing community, we're going to look at how they were holy and how they were organized. Yes, organization is good, and holy is really good. But in Christianity, there's often a misunderstanding of the word holy. So let's kind of take a look at this. One of the things that I think is important is we needed to realize, or we need to realize, there was a community-wide sense of holiness, okay? In other words, uh, we need to motivate, motivate each other to be holy. Let's look at Exodus 19.6. God said, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. So in other words, God was saying the whole community was to be holy. Okay? 
God called uh, Israel out of Egypt, and they were all holy as a group. But also, they had to be holy as individuals. So I'm not saying that holiness as an individual isn't important. It's very important, and we're going to look at it in a minute, because that affects the whole community. So holiness was expected of the individual, but also holiness was expected as a nation. Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, uh, Abraham was trying to find at least 10 righteous, you know, that might stand for the community. But the more righteous people you have in a community, uh, like in America, you know, the more likely we'll be able to tip the hand of God one way or another when it comes to judgment. And who knows if you as an individual might be that one more that's needed to keep judgment from falling. So that's why it's important for the whole community to be holy, but also for individuals to be holy. If we look at Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, because Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Do you guys remember that whole story? Here you have the whole congregation was to be holy, but one individual affected the whole nation. They were all judged because of what one person did. So you can see how some people say, well, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. You ever heard that before? Well, people don't realize when, when you sin, you affect more than you. You affect your spouse, you affect your kids. You know, especially with verbal abuse, emotional abuse, all these things, people need to realize you have an effect on people. And you, individuals can affect an entire community. Individuals can affect an entire nation. Think about this. What did this, this whole riots going on in the Middle East started with one guy lighting himself on fire. And I mean, my goodness, the, the whole world is upside down. <clears throat> so look at Joshua 7, 10 through 13. Here the Lord says to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face? You know what? That's kind of a good point too. I mean, prayer is important and we need to cry out to God. But sometimes God says, why don't you get up and do something? Okay, so there's a balance in all of this. He said, look, Israel sinned. They've also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. They've even taken of the accursed thing. They've also stolen. Uh, they've dissembled also. They put, in, they put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and tell them to sanctify yourselves against the morrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of you, O Israel, that you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So here you have one guy, and it affected the entire nation they lost in battle. And you look you know, at you know, some of our battles, some of our wars, Israel's battles, Israel's wars, I thought it was pretty good. I, I don't remember who it was, but one of the leaders of the Israeli government recently said, we need to depend on God and not on the other nations to win our wars now. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's very huge. And so uh, we need to realize that we need to have a commitment to individual holiness because that affects everybody. What does it say? A little leaven leavens what? Okay, and so we do think that as an individual, a little sin in my life affects my whole life. But guess what? A little sin in the congregation can affect the whole congregation too. How many churches have you seen fall apart because somebody molested somebody? Or whatever. Something can happen and the whole place can just go to pot and everyone leaves and whatever. Or, you know, someone ends up ripping someone off of a lot of money or something like that. Or who knows, whatever it is, adultery, whatever. There's, there's all kinds of things. <clears throat> but that's why we need to... If, we, first off, we need to see we're all in the boat together. We're all in the same boat. We're all rowing together. And you can't have one person drilling a hole in the boat. <laughs> okay? That affects the community. Okay? So we need to encourage each other, support each other, and say, please don't drill a hole in the boat. <clears throat> all right? Now... The other thing we need to realize is God's standard for holiness is the same and has never changed. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Was he holy back then? Is he holy now? Did he tell them back then to be holy for I am holy? And what do we see here in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 in the New Testament? But as he which is called you is holy, 
so be you holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So here we see holiness is just as much a part of the new covenant as it is the old covenant, it's the same covenant, because it's the same God. And so he wouldn't say, okay, now you don't have to be holy. Now, I think part of the problem we have is an understanding of holiness. Let me give it to you this way. If I were to say something is clean, what is the opposite of clean? Now, what's the opposite of holy? No, it's common. Holy means to separate. So sometimes we think, we look at, you know, something that's very bad, you know, and we, so we think if I'm not bad, I must be holy. If you're common, you're not holy. <clears throat> and that's what we really need to realize. Holiness means to not be common, not to be bad, not to be unholy. That's not what it means. Holiness, holiness means don't to be common anymore. When you find there are just as many divorces in the church as there is outside of the church, it's now common. There is no holiness. <clears throat> when you find, you know, uh, you know, there, I mean, look at the, some of the, the leaders of congregations who have fallen, you know, everything. I mean, what, but we have to be more than not bad. I look at it here. Okay, here's bad. You know, everyone, I don't, you know, I'm a good person. I don't, well, that's common. Okay, so it's not just being bad and it's not being common. Being holy is over here. And I think the problem that we have today is the, the line keeps moving. Okay, the line keeps moving. Think about, uh, like in a tug of war. Think of here's the, here's the line, and we're, we're in a tug of war, and here's the little rag hanging down, and we're trying to be, let's say this is common right here. And the evil is trying to pull us toward common or toward un, you know, unrighteousness. But we're trying to be holy, and we're trying to pull this way, okay? But what the problem I see happening in the world today is the flag is moving. And so we end up moving with it. And so we're going downhill and we think we're holy because we're better than these people here and this people here, but we've just moved 30 feet this way. <clears throat> Holiness was to be a way of life as far as even in regard for life, okay? If we're holy, common is, you know, abortion is fine. Holy is, no, we have a regard for life, it's not fine. I'm reminded of, I don't know if you guys heard about this, there's this crazy person in San Francisco, there are several crazy people in San Francisco, <laughs> but this one in particular was saying, do you remember we got Hanukkah coming up? You know, Purim's coming up, but we also have Hanukkah, you know, this coming around the corner. But one of the things that they said, they, they forbade the Torah, right? They forbade the Sabbath. If you follow Torah, if you kept the Sabbath, if you circumcised your kids, you were killed. Just last week, I read in the news, there's a guy in San Francisco who is trying to outlaw circumcision. They're saying it's with a year in jail and a thousand dollar fine if you circumcise your kids. Now this reminds me of what was going on during Hanukkah. They were trying to outlaw these things of God. And this is just craziness. But anyway, we need to have a regard for life. We need to have as far as holiness in the way we value life. Holiness also was to be in our families and in our society. And I think uh, in a lot of ways, we've lost <clears throat> the idea of holiness within our families. Especially in our society. We need to have holiness in our worship. You know, sometimes some worship services is more just concerts and it's just, it's not really worship. The more entertainment. We need to have holiness in our jobs. Now, sometimes we can, that's kind of difficult, but how many of you know, I mean, especially if you're around construction workers sometimes, you know, you get in some jobs where it's like, oh my goodness, how can I live like this, work like this? But we need to be holy in our jobs. In other words, I mean, we need to not be common. If you're common, that's not holy. 
if you're just like everybody else, you need to stand out. This kind of reminds me of um, a situation when I was in the Agape Force. I'd just gotten saved. I was like 19 years old. And what we would do as a group, there was like 10 of us, and we'd go to different cities and we would witness, or we'd go and collect food at one door and then give it to the people at the next door. You know, it was just whoever needed, whoever wanted to give would give. But we would, we evangelized. We were on the streets witnessing and the like. But one of the things that we would do in the evening, we would go into the same, like let's say we were in Chicago for a week witnessing, okay? We, some, we would basically sleep on the floor for a whole year. I lived on the, out of a sleeping bag in a suitcase for a year on the floor sleeping, just full-time missionary type stuff. But what we would do, we would go to the same McDonald's every night to eat at McDonald's. We weren't really health addicts, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that we weren't there yet. But anyway, what we would do when we were done eating, we would look around, we would get up, and we would clear off all the tables of all the trash that was still on the tables besides our own. And then we left, and we didn't say a word. And the next night, we'd go in there, and again, we were done eating, we'd get up, we just wouldn't say a word, we'd get up, we'd clear off all the tables, throw the stuff in the trash, and go and leave. And the third night, we'd go in there, and all of a sudden, the manager comes up to me, uh, you know, or to us, our group, and says, who are you guys? What's going on here? And so then we told him, well, you know, we're, what we're doing. And he goes, well, tonight the, the meal's on us, you know. But, but that is being different. How often do you see someone when they go in, they clear the other tables as well as their own? Again, this is just uh, being holy. It's being set apart. That's what it means. It's just do something that's different. Did you guys that were here like that football video Saturday morning? Was that good? <clears throat> but that's what, we have to begin to do things that are different. I, I think the best type of evangelism is to speak when they notice a difference. At, when they ask you what's different, that's the best time to evangelize. But we also need to be holy in our clothing. We need to be holy in our food. We need to be holy in our possessions. Uh, we need to be holy in our actions. I mean, the Bible says we're to speak the truth, but how are we to speak it? In love. And I think that's really important in the Hebrew Roots movement because sometimes we can get so much in the mind, you know, that we end up battling with people rather than just speaking the truth in love. And you know what? And this is just my own perspective on some of these things. To me, it's relationships are what's important. Sometimes I would rather be wrong and keep the relationship. Who cares? I mean, on some issues, who really cares? I mean, if it's not a salvational issue, who cares? A relationship to me is more important. Um, I think we need to be holy in our motives, not just in our outward behavior. You know, a lot of people can appear real holy on the outside, but they're not holy on the inside. But God wants us to be the same through and through. Uh, you'll find when you read the Torah, they were even to be holy in warfare. And this reminds me of something else that's just absolutely crazy. But, I mean, I don't know how many of you have read it, but read the Torah portions on warfare. They, there were certain things they could do, they could not do. Uh, they had to treat the ladies with respect. If you remember the Torah, you know, if they wanted to marry one of the ladies that they took in war, first they had to do, you know, make her shave her hair and mourn and do all these things so that they would end up seeing the lady as a person and not as some object. But what's incredible, there was an Arab lady who lived in Israel who had written that the Jews were racist, the Jewish soldiers, because they would not take advantage of the Arab women prisoners of war. <laughs> and it's like, what, are you nuts? They, they, they get it if they do, they get it if they don't. But it's just like, I mean, it's just crazy. Now, the other thing that they were, besides holy, they were organized. So let's take a look at how they were organized. And I'm, this is the book that I want everyone to know about. I don't know how many of you have read this book. It's very good. We have a case of them back there. It's called Yeshua, A Guide to the Real Jesus and the Original Church. And I think this is, I mean, all too often we have preconceived notions about how things were. I mean, just like this is a common thing. People think that all the sacrifices were for sin when the vast majority were not for sin. But if that's what you've been taught, that's what you believe. 
I spoke this uh, last night. I was at Life Center to the senior group, and I was speaking to the senior group, and I was telling them about how uh, there's a perception among, how many of you have ever heard of the blood libel? You know, they believe that the Jews take Christian children and kill them and use their blood to make their matzah for Passover. I'm serious. This is still going around today. That's what people, that's what they teach. You know, and, and these poor Arab kids get filled with all this hate and propaganda and they think it's true and they're terrified. Well, that's, I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, in Christianity, I mean, it's not that, but we've been raised thinking the Jews believe one way and they don't believe that way at all. But we just assume it. And sometimes we assume the early church was a certain way. I, I literally had a, uh, I was at a congregation as a visitor and there was supposedly some big traveling evangelist, very popular, and he was speaking, as a matter of fact, we'll be touching on that here in a little bit, but he was teaching on how the early Christians, you know, in Acts, it talks about how they would go house to house. It's because they weren't accepted in the synagogues. And I thought, what? That's not what that said at all. You have no understanding what you're talking about. And we'll look at that here in a minute. But this book talks about what the original I don't even like using the word original church because the church began clear back at Sinai. But in the, the language that he's trying to use to reach Christians is to the church, basically in the book of Acts, what it was like back then. So what I'm going to be sharing with you now is from this book. So if you don't like anything I say, take it up with Dr. Ron Mosley. <clears throat> but what he wrote here uh, in a second century historical writing, this is in the 100s because you don't count the first hundred years. So the first century is zero. The second century is the 100s. In a second century historical writing, uh, there was an author named <laughs> and uh, he, uh, Hegesippus. Anyway, he described the rivalry that was between a certain man named Thabothus and others who were seeking the position of bishop after the death of James. Well, I put in Jacob there because James really wasn't James. A lot of Christians think his name was James. There was no James. His name was Jacob. Um, but when the brother of Yeshua, you know, he was basically the first leader in Jerusalem, he dies, and these people are arguing over who's going to take his place of the Jerusalem assembly. And it so happens that the Jewish believers chose Simeon, who was a cousin of Yeshua, to take his place. Uh, there's another man who I've talked about in the past called Epiphanius. He was one of the quote-unquote early church fathers of uh, the first millennium. He lived in the fourth century, which is around Constantine's time, 300s. And he listed all the believing Jewish leaders of the Jerusalem assembly all the way up to the Bar Kokhba revolt from 132 to 135 AD. So what does that mean? That means for the first 100 years of Yeshua, from 30 AD to 130 AD, the first 100 years, there were only Jewish leaders running the Jewish congregation in Jerusalem. Okay, but they were all believers. But anyway, if you're not familiar with the uh, Bar Kokhba rebellion, uh, Hadrian, he crushed the Jewish people. He renamed Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina, and the Jews were forbidden to enter Jerusalem for a hundred years. Now think about this. You have all these Jewish synagogues in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I'll mention to you here in a minute, there's like, there were over 400 synagogues in Jerusalem in the first century. And now, guess what? All the Jews left. Now, not all the Jewish synagogues were believing synagogues, but many of the synagogues were made up of a bunch of believers. The whole synagogue would have been made up of Jewish believers. Well, what happened, let me put up this little, my first PowerPoint. I'm not saying Petra, I'm saying Pella. Here is the Dead Sea, here's Jerusalem, here's the Sea of Galilee. This was like part of the Decapolis, those 10 northern cities in Jordan. Here's Pella. And here's where a lot of the Jews fled to, was Pella, okay? So I just wanted you to see Jerusalem, the Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, here's Damascus, Syria, Caesarea Philippi, you could kind of look at that map. But here's what happened. A lot of the Jewish believers fled to Pella in obedience to Yeshua's comments in Matthew 24, 16. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, you know, get the heck out of here. So that's what they did. But what happens now, Gentile believers are now left in control of the assembly for the first time. 
and they quickly appointed someone to be the first non-Jewish leader. So for the first 100 years, from 30 AD to 130 AD, the early church was run by Jewish believers who held to the Torah and the temple, and there was no separation from the synagogue. See, this one leader I was telling you about thought there was some big separation, and that's why they had to meet house to house. That's ridiculous. They, for the first 100 years, they met in synagogues. And uh, there were over 400 synagogues in Jerusalem during the first century. Now, I'm going to put up another PowerPoint. I kind of have this in my notes, but if you want to keep it nice and organized. Here's how the, the early church was run, because the early church was Jewish. They met in synagogues, and here's how all the synagogues were run, and here's how the early church was run. There was the principal leader who was called the Nasi, which is, can also be considered as the president. Uh, they were even still called president rather than pastor as late as 150 A.D., the Nazi was considered the administrator of the synagogue. Okay, then you have the, <clears throat> the public minister was called the Chazan. He was the one who prayed and preached behind a wooden pulpit. He did not read from the Torah, but he stood beside the one who did to always correct and to oversee that it was done properly. And he would select seven readers each week who were well educated in the Torah. Uh, this group consisted of a priest, a Levite, and then five regular Jews. But look at this, the Chazan was known as the overseer of the congregation or the angel of the church. So in Revelation, when they write to the angel of a church, this is the person they're writing to. They're not writing to some floating angel that's over a church in space. He's writing to the Chazan, okay, of that particular congregation. There were also three men known as almoners or Parnassin, who they were the ones that cared for the poor. They were also expected to be scholars of the Torah as well. There was another function in the ancient synagogue who was the Shaliach, from which we get the term apostle. There was also the Magid. He was a migratory evangelist of the first century who spoke to various congregations. There was also a Balan who was a scholarly teacher. So when you're reading Ephesians 4.11 about the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, that was nothing new. Some people think that was a new Christian church invention. That had been going on for a thousand years. Okay? This is, this is what they always had. And then uh, you have the Zakan. The Zakan is the one who provided counsel to the people. In Judaism, those who reached the age of 40 were considered to have finally attained understanding. Those over 50 were considered worthy to counsel the younger people. <clears throat> the rabbi had the responsibility of reading and preaching the word, exhorting and edifying the people. There was also an interpreter known as the Meturgan who was skilled in languages who stood by the one reading the Torah and he would translate into Greek or Hebrew or Latin or whatever the language was, whatever, whoever's in the congregation. In Matthew 10, 27, when Yeshua says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak you in light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach you upon the housetops. Well, the teacher speaks into the interpreter's ears, and then he would shout it out to the others. So this is directly referring to what they were already familiar with in the synagogue. The teacher speaks into the interpreter's ears, and he would shout it out to the others. Now this may be a come as a shock. Especially like to that one pastor in the book of Acts where he's talking about how they couldn't meet in the synagogues or meeting house to house. Do you know there were no Gentiles in the believing assembly for the first 10 years? In Acts 10, think about this. In Acts 10, where Peter is strongly urged three different times, will you please go to Cornelius' house, a Gentile? That, take, that took place 10 years after Messiah had ascended. And if you remember, Peter still thought it was unlawful for Jews to be in a Gentile house. And if that was 10 years later, and he's the leader, and he thought it was unlawful to be in a Gentile's house, do you think they were meeting house to house with the Gentiles in the book of Acts? No. Let's look at Acts 2, 44 through 46. Let's look at the actual verse. It says, And all that believed were together and had all things common, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men and as every man had need. Now look at this. And they continued how often? 
daily with one accord where? In the temple. So how often were they in the temple? Every day. They were breaking bread from where? House to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So here you have all these Jewish believers who are every day in the synagogue. And because they had, they were, they had something in common, which is Yeshua, they also would go have meals with each other. Now, how can you jump from that and say the Gentiles had to meet in the house because they weren't accepted in the synagogues, but it had nothing to do with Gentiles to begin with? These are Jewish people who had Yeshua in common, and so they're breaking bread from house to house. They're having a great fellowship, and they're meeting daily in the temple. And then look at Acts 5, 39 through 42. Here it says, if this be of God, you can't overthrow it till less happily you be found even to fight against God. And so to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles, they beat them. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Yeshua and let them go. But what happened? It says they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And then what? And daily in the temple and where? In every house they cease not to teach and preach Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. So even though they were commanded not to do it, they still did it anyway. They still met in the temple. They still met house to house. They still preached and taught about Yeshua. So again, daily they were in the temple. They did not forsake the temple system. Then we jump to Acts 10, 28, which is the verse which took place 10 years after Messiah ascended. And here Peter is speaking to a Gentile and he says, you know how it's unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into a one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now remember, there's a difference between common and unclean. Most people don't know the difference between common and unclean. When you he hear he's talking, of, first off, if you'll notice, he says, don't call any man common and unclean. It doesn't say food. Okay? And he, he doesn't, that doesn't mean that now I can eat humans. I can be a cannibal. So this had nothing to do with food, guys. Okay? What he, he was saying is, look, I'm not to call any man common or unclean. And if Peter, who was the leader, was believing clear up to then that they couldn't even go to a house of a someone from another nation, believe me, they weren't meeting house to house with Gentiles. It's 25 years after the ascension. Look at this. 25 years after the ascension, what do we find? Acts 21, 20. It says, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of Torah. So we can see, even up for the first 25 years, all the, Jew, all the believers were basically Jews. They still met daily in the temple. They still were zealous for Torah. And then in Acts 21, 26, what do we see? Paul took them in, and the next day he purified himself with them. He entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So 25 years later, you still have Jews who believed in Torah. And what were they doing? They were even doing the sacrifices still in the temple. I don't have this, first ver this one verse, but there was thousands of priests who were believers in Yeshua who still d uh, were involved with the whole temple system. And let's look at Acts 11, verse 25 and 26. We're going to jump back as far as in the book of Acts for a minute here. This is another kind of misinterpreted verse, but it gives you an idea of what it was like in the early church, quote unquote, in the New Testament. Here we see, uh, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and they taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Everyone's familiar with that verse, right? But what I want you to notice, it does not say they were first called Christians. It says it was in Antioch that they first were called Christians. You following? Do you see the difference in English here anyway? They were called another name long before they were called Christians. So it wasn't they were Christians was the first title they had. They had other titles. But it was in Antioch was the first place they were called Christians. Let's take a look at some of the other names. Uh, first off, Christian does not come from the Hebrew, but from the Greek. It was never used by the early disciples themselves. The very phrase they were called suggests the name that other people called them, not what they called themselves. 
So what were the early names the believers were called before others called them Christian? Well, let's take a look at Acts chapter 24, verse 5. It says, we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. He's a ringleader of the sect called what? The Nazarenes. They were called Nazarenes before they were called Christians. And why do you think they were called Nazarenes? What town was Yeshua from? Hello. Then another name they had was followers of the way. And this is based on Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 where it says, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Well, what do we find in Acts 24, 14? It says, but this I confess to you that after the way, which they call what? What do they call it? Heresy. So you have another name here. And I'll show you that. It says, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the Torah and in the prophets. The unbelieving Jews used the Hebrew term minim for the believing Jews, and that means heretics. So some of the other names that they had was the sect of the Nazarenes. They were called followers of the way. They were called a minim, which means a bunch of heretics. And then they were also called Christians. And I think think what this book points out the Christians weren't the Jewish believers per se. It was what Gentiles called Gentiles who followed the way. They were the ones that were called Christians, not necessarily the believing Jews, because they were part of the synagogue. But back then, it was just a branch of Judaism. <clears throat> now, we got a few minutes for questions. So does anyone have any questions on what they've learned so far? In Cornerstone. In Cornerstone. <laughs> what we've been talking about. Would you hand this to Jeff? You can be my official runner arounder. Now don't give it to him, hold on to it. <laughs> what can I say? Mark, I, I was doing a study about the different types of Judaism sex. There was quite a few. Yes, there is, there's and a lot. They were very varied. So when we were dealing with the Sanhedrin, how many different sects, or can you talk a little bit about the different sects that yeah. were part of the Sanhedrin? Well, I don't know if I can, t- t- uh, I mean, obviously you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I'm not sure how many, what the percentage was or what that made up the Sanhedrin. But let me talk about present day. Our, most Christians know there's denominations in Christianity, but did you guys know there's denominations in Judaism? Yeah. Do most of you know, is there anyone who didn't know that? Okay, so, but there's, there's denominations in Judaism. There's your Reformed, and your Reformed basically are more like very social, political. They don't want nothing to do with Torah. I mean, they don't even believe Adam existed, Noah existed. Some of them don't even believe Moses existed. Your Reformed Jews are extremely liberal, okay? They don't follow Torah. Then you have like your conservative Jews. Now, your conservative Jews will follow the Torah, but they want nothing to do with the Talmud, Okay, and you have your Orthodox Jews, you know, and they have the Torah and the Talmud. Uh, you have your ultra-Orthodox. Uh, you have your Chabad. Uh, you have your Reconstructionists. You got all these different groups, you know, and so you can't lump all Jews together. You also have your secular atheists. The vast majority of Jews are secular atheists, you know, and so you, it's just like anything. You can't put, label everybody in one group. But as far as the makeup of the Sanhedrin, I'm not sure. You'd have to find out. Any other question? Testing? Okay. Um, My thought earlier was when you were talking about holiness, uh, the difference between being holy versus being good or bad, that concept. Well, some people talk, you think when you read the Torah or you read the Word of God, and you think, okay, I'm going to apply this to my life, and I'm going to be good, and I'm going to do all these things. What's the difference than being good in our eyes of what the Word of God says versus being good at doing the normal thing that people do as a good thing in our eyes today? You know, how do we be holy or set apart continually um, versus just being good or bad? Well, I think how a do we lot of stay it, there? Sure. Well, a lot of people will do good deeds, okay? But I think holiness is more than just doing good deeds. It goes to your motivation. 
If you're just doing things, uh, I mean, going to church, is that a good thing to do? But if you go to church just to sell Amway or meet a boyfriend or meet a girlfriend, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, what to God, to me, true holiness is more than just doing good things. It has to be a good source. The, the source has to be good. What is the, the heart motivation for what we're doing? If we give, even to God, if we only give to gift, that's not giving, that's trading. Yeah. Okay. So, I, yes, in the back. So I'm thinking that you're talking about condition of the heart, holiness as a way of life rather than an action that sure. we take. And so it's your whole being. Yeah, everything that you do. Yes, I think, I think that is, is, what is it, where it's at. It's, it's got to be an entire way of life. The source has to be good from the very beginning because people can do a lot of good things, but if, it's, if the source is bad then it's, it's not really, as far as I'm concerned, really holy. God wants us to be holy. He wants us completely set apart. Karen? Oh. Uh, one of the things that helped me was to, when I, <clears throat> the two things are walking after the spirit and walking after the flesh. Walking after the flesh is when you depend on yourself. And walking after the spirit is when you, depend on God and he's your source right he's your resource of everything right and so like you said it's it's motive if it's done out of love if you know or duty you know exactly I, I think so I think so I, I think uh, just like if everything we're doing I mean sin is to miss the mark okay so you have a target here and you're missing the mark okay and then a lot of people think all sin is the same well that's not true all sin is the same in the fact that it offends God and hurts people, but you can't say stealing a candy bar is the same as murder. They're not the same. But you can have people who miss the, they're missing the mark, and then it goes to people who are shooting the other direction. They're not even aiming at the mark. And I believe when we get saved or into a relationship with God, we stop shooting the other direction we are now shooting the right direction. We may still miss the mark. Holiness doesn't mean you're never gonna sin. We're still gonna miss the mark, but our heart is right. Well, we're gonna get up and we're gonna keep going, but there's a big difference between missing the mark and going the completely opposite direction. Go ahead. So then, just to clarify a little further then, um, If we do the things that the word tells us to do, and we do it with the right heart, then the end goal is to do it so it glorifies and edifies God. So that our, what we're doing is to go, okay, no, look, don't look at me. What I just did was not because I wanted you to see me, but what I did was so you would see God's love for That's you. That's why it says in the Bible that they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. Yeah. So. It doesn't see that they may see your good works and glorify you. But the problem is if we do these good things so they glorify us, that's not holy, that's common. Amen. Oh yes, I see hands in the back, very back. Can you talk about um, communion? As they were going house to house, I don't well, believe it. It says they were, they were doing breaking communion. bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't say communion, it says they were breaking bread. And every Friday night they have challah which of course is leavened bread. Uh, and you don't want to use leavened bread for communion anyway, because communion is supposed to represent the body of Messiah who was unleavened. So if you, there's nothing wrong with doing communion, but for heaven's sake, don't use leavened bread, use unleavened bread. But they were meeting house to house and they were having challah like they do on Friday nights. They were just breaking bread. They were fellowshipping, they were eating. So that's what that was. Now, that is a whole other topic, I guess. Some people may be wondering, do we ever do communion here? That kind of thing. I don't know if that was part of your question or whatever. Uh, in uh, the New Testament, where, when Yeshua said, do this in remembrance of me, he was referring to Passover. And what's amazing to me is that's the one thing the Christians don't do, is Passover. But uh, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with, quote unquote, doing communion. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can do it every week, every day. You know, however often you want, as a community, we do it once a year on Passover. That's what he was referring to. 
even aside from that, though, there's nothing wrong with you guys having communion in your house every day, every Friday with people and taking communion. My only suggestion is use unleavened bread, not leavened bread. But also, but what they were talking about in the Bible was just simply they ate together. They broke bread. Bread, just the word bread back then could just like, hey, you got any bread? Really means what? Money. Okay, bread just was just a general term, but they broke bread. They had fellowship. That wasn't communion. It was just they fellowshiped. Go ahead. Okay, two questions. Uh, one, um, I, someone said a rabbi had informed them that there's more uh, Messianic believers in Jerusalem 20 years after the resurrection than uh, the non-believers. And I wondered if that was true, if you'd heard of that. You said if there weren't any or there was few? He, he said there were, the Messianics outnumbered the... Oh, I think, I think the Messianics outnumbered the... I think the believing Jews outnumbered unbelieving Jews 20 years later. You bet, yeah. you bet. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of priests that believed in Yeshua that still operated in the temple. Yeah. Remember it says there was the 3,000 that got saved in Acts? Those were not Gentiles. They were Jews. Okay, and then the 5,000 more, they were more Jews. And then it talks about the tens of thousands of Jews who were all zealous for Torah in Acts 21. And this is like 20 years later. So there was, yeah, the, the believing Jews far outnumbered unbelieving Jews in the first century. And then my other question was, uh, you mentioned the town of Nazareth, but I was told that, it, that the town didn't exist back then. That was just the area. Is that true? Or? Well, there, it was just like the Galilee you know, yeah. whether there was an, what was called Branch Town is Nazareth. But from what I, the last tour guide when I was in Israel, I remember it was this time of the time before, said Nat, there, it, it did exist, but it was so small when uh, Yeshua and Joseph as a carpenter, I mean, there was maybe like 30 or 40 people there. He had to go to another town not too far away to, to work, to make a living. So it depends on how you define town. I mean, is the 20 people considered a town? Because I know um, one... One uh, tour guide said Gomlet fits the description better of the synagogue where he could be thrown off the, off the cliff. And I had never heard that before. He said that Gomla fits uh, the description yeah, much yeah, better. Gamla. Than, yeah, Gomla. Yeah. You think yeah, that's it, true? Yeah, it probably was. Well, it could have been. I mean, look at uh, even today, the suburbs of one town or another town. You got Puyallup and Tacoma. It's almost the same thing. I mean, if, I don't know how close Gamla was to Nazareth, and Nazareth was small. I mean, it's still, it's, you know, within the same geographic area. Over in the back, over here on this side. You just skimmed over it today about the food. How do you stay holy regarding food? How do you stay holy regarding food? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. Well, you know what the verse which says, be holy for I am holy? That's quoting a verse in Leviticus that had to do with food. And it goes back to what is clean and unclean. If you remember, the first sin in the garden had to do with putting food in your mouth. It did. And God, food is a big issue. Now, again, just to reiterate this, and I've, I've taught on Acts 10 before, but for those of you that are here on Acts 10, holiness doesn't mean better. Holiness just means set apart. You can take your grandma's dishes and they can be holy if you don't use them. Holiness does not mean righteous. Holiness just means to be set apart. As a matter of fact, prostitutes back then were called holy. They were set apart for a work. So, it, so you have, first off, you have to remember, holy does not mean better. Holy just means set apart, okay? And God told Israel, I want you to be holy. I don't want you to eat certain things. And so, yeah, he says, right. See, if I make my grandma's dishes holy, they're holy to me. They're not holy to you. You could care less about my grandma's dishes. And so man can make things holy, but they're only holy to man. They're not holy to God. When God tells us to what he considers to be holy to him, then we have to do what he considers to be holy to him. And so he said, there's certain foods you don't eat, certain foods you do eat. But now if you remember about, let me see, I think about a thousand years before was Noah. And God told Noah, you can eat everything. You can eat everything that moves. So Noah, now Noah did know the difference between clean and unclean because he took only so many unclean animals on the ark and so many clean animals on the ark. And God told Noah, you can eat 
anything that was alive. So for Noah, he could eat unclean food. But then God took Israel and said, now I don't want you to be common. Everyone is eating everything. I want you set apart. I want you to only eat clean food. That's what made them holy. That doesn't mean better. It just means set apart. Now, so I believe it's a sanctification issue, not a salvation issue. There are people here at El Shaddai that eat unclean food. I don't care. I'll go to their house and they can have their unclean food. I mean, and, and I'm not judging them or anything like that. Who cares? It's a, but it is a sanctification issue. It, it depends on how set apart do you want to be. There's a story of this one guy, he, he was going to hire a chauffeur, and he had these three guys that were all going to try out, and he was at the top of a mountain. And he said, okay, we're going to see how fast we can get down to the bottom of the mountain. And the first chauffeur, man, he was down there just going, driving like crazy, he got to the bottom. Then he went to the second guy, and the second guy tried to outbeat the first guy, and he went down even faster. And then the third guy said, okay, you know, let's see what you can do. And it took this guy about three hours. He hugged the inside lane. He said, there ain't no way. I'm not crazy. And the guy says, I'm hiring you. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so it's, uh, to me, when it comes to holiness, think of it this way. Remember, you have the Israelite, the Levite, and the priest, the son of Aaron. Three different categories. You also have the 30, the 60, and 100 fold. I believe every believer that's eating unclean food is still going to heaven. Okay? But the point is, how set apart do you want to be? Do you want to be 30, 60, or 100? Okay, all of Israel was saved in Egypt, and they could get around the tabernacle. But only the Levites could be close, and they had to protect the people from the tabernacle. But then the sons of Aaron had to protect the Levites from the ark, or they would die. And then among the sons of Aaron, you know, only the high priest could go in once a year. And so for me, it's not a salvational issue. It's how sanctified do you want, how set apart do you want to be? How close to God do you want to be? You're, you're saved, you go to heaven, but how much do you, how set apart do you want to be? But it's not just food, it's in all of our way of life. The food is just part of, it's a small part of the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's our heart. How close do we want to be to God? Now, this brings up a whole nother concept that I've talked about before, and I'm not dogmatic. I don't have all the answers. These are just what I think, and I could be wrong. I'm not saying this has to be this way. But if you remember, the Ark of the Covenant is at the center of the whole camp of Israel. And what's in the Ark of the Covenant? The Torah. Okay. Now, do you remember when God created Eve? Adam, remember you have the first Adam, and Yeshua was the second Adam. Okay, they're types of each other. Okay, so you have Adam, and when God created a bride, he took Adam's body and he took a rib out to form his bride, right? The whole body did not become the bride. The rib became the bride, a remnant. So I don't believe the whole body of Messiah is gonna become the bride of Messiah. I believe a part of the body is gonna be pulled out that will make the bride. And it's the rib that's closest to his heart. Those that have the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments. So all believers are part of the body of Messiah. Whether you eat clean or unclean food, do you want to be part of the bride? How holy do you want to be? So that's my take on it. So... Let's close with prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for what you're doing in this world. And I pray, Lord, that we would just love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we wouldn't be satisfied with just making it in. Because truly, we don't want to just make it in for ourselves. We want to bring you glory and show Satan how, just like Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Satan said that Job just loved you, God, because of what you do for him. God, we don't serve you for that reason. We serve you because we love you and we are passionate about you and we love your heart and we want to go all for you and do what you ask us to do, not just so we can make it in, but because we want a relationship with you. Bless your people in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, 
please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.